Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Community Baptist Church this morning on this Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to start with a word of prayer and uh, after I just give an announcement and then uh, I want to have a word of prayer for all those who have uh, are currently serving our country. I want to thank you for many of our church have served active duty in the military. Some are active duty, some are retired or uh, in between at this particular time. But uh, this morning at 8.35 a.m., a gentleman, a member of our church for a number of years, Melvin Bates, uh, as a former uh, submariner, 91 years old, would have been 92 this July, went home to be with the Lord this morning, and uh, he was over at Beechwood uh, Nursing Facility, and uh, it was rather a, a quick uh, passing. He was in the hospital just a couple weeks ago, and then uh, they shipped him there, and uh, he was just, um, his body was just wearing out. He was getting older and weaker, and uh, but, uh, knew the Lord as a Savior. I was able to talk with Elaine this morning in between services. My phone started going off while I was up here preaching. That always makes me nervous because most people know not to call the pastor while he's preaching, uh, but I knew that it had to be important. So as soon as service was over, I checked and had the message from Elaine, went and called her. Uh, but uh, she knows where he is as well, and so we're thankful that he had faith in Lord Jesus Christ, but uh, served a majority of his 20 years uh, out of Groton, and uh, just a good man. But here on Memorial Day weekend, uh, he gets to go home to even a greater memorial to see his Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, so we're thankful for that. But uh, for all of you that have served, actively serving, and of course your families, thank you so much for your service. My dad, as well as a Vietnam vet, and uh, he's still living and down in South Carolina, my sister, uh, served in the army as well as her husband and uh, so we have many connections of course with our churches but then also with family members and friends who have served but then of course Memorial Day is to honor those who have served and have uh, given their their greatest sacrifice their life for our country as well and so we're very grateful for our nation for what we do stand for and then of course for those who serve to protect us and so if you would let's start with a word of prayer uh, and uh, ask God's blessing upon uh, our military, those who are uh, serving as well, then uh, a thankfulness for those who have served our country to give us the freedoms that we do have. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you now, we are thankful for those here present who have both uh, our active duty, who protect our country and serve and, and make uh, time sacrifices and, and other sacrifices that some uh, do not. Uh, we, we thank you for, for people who are willing to do that and the families that come alongside them and serve faithfully as they're about their duties. Then, Lord, today we uh, know of this homegoing of one of our own, Melvin, as he is now in your presence. I uh, can only imagine uh, what uh, he's experiencing right now. And uh, I thank you for Elaine, who's also a member here and served here faithfully with us. Uh, we ask that you would please uh, be with the family as they prepare now and uh, that you would bring comfort and healing there. We also then, Lord, thank you for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, who have died uh, in defense and in battles. And uh, no doubt, Lord, as a sobering time as we consider and reflect for those who have given, we thank you for them and their families and the loss that their survivors have felt, but also for the freedoms we have in this country. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would please be merciful to our nation, as there are many things that are different than what it was in its early days. And we would ask for another revival of hearts and minds turned towards you as their Lord and their Savior. But we also know, Lord, that as the days go by, we, we know that before you return, uh, that things will ultimately uh, not be the same as it once was. And we just ask you to help us as Christians to be faithful to your cause and to your purposes and that we look forward to a day that we get to see you face to face as well. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to just make mention of these. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, Pastor Mike read this portion of Scripture for us uh, earlier. It's just a, a, a small portion of the entire passage. We're going to be studying down through verse number 10 uh, this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And I have two aspects of this uh, two main points with this message. Uh, the first is the spiritual desire of the new believer, and the second is the spiritual blessings of the new believer. And that's uh, tied in with verses 4 through 10. Verses, verses 1 through 3 deal with the spiritual desire of the new believer. I've given the title of this message, The Spiritual Benefits of Salvation. What do we benefit from being someone who has trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? There are many benefits, but in this passage it speaks to uh, several of those, and uh, this is not um, uh, all the information that the New Testament shares with us about the benefits of our salvation, but in this particular text, 
And I always like to set the tone. Why was Peter writing this? And when we see what he starts off in chapter number two, remember the, the chapter delineations weren't in the original text. This was added by translators to give us a little more clarity. But here, really, chapter two, verses one to three, just continue from uh, chapter one. And so it should be all kind of read and understood together. And then it seems to be a good transition as we look at verse four down to as Peter is continuing this idea uh, about what we have in our position as those who have trusted Christ as their, as their personal Savior through salvation. And so I'll try to do my best to explain this to you here this morning, and I think you'll catch on as we go along through this. But um, as we look here at the spiritual benefits of salvation, uh, the first thing that we see that is mentioned in verses 1 through 3 is what I'm calling this spiritual desire that should be in the heart of every new believer. If you don't have a desire to honor God, then are you truly a born-again believer? Because a born-again believer will have a desire to honor their God, not a question about it. That is something that just is a part of, of, of you, as we'll see here, you use the illustration of a baby desiring the milk of uh, his mother as one as a new believer should desire to be fed spiritually from uh, the Word of God. And so as we look here, we'll understand this a little bit more. But I want you to start with me in verse number 23 of chapter 1, because this kind of sets the tone for where we're going. So the, the idea of being born again, uh, this is a spiritual birth, not a physical second birth. So we know that we're born in this world physically, and uh, this is now talking about this spiritual birth. I don't want to re-preach last week's message, so we'll just jump into this. In verse number 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the, what? Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So this kind of sets a tone for us for this idea of being born again. Another word for being born again, the, the word actually that this comes out of is regeneration, being uh, made new, made alive. This is talking about spiritual aspect of us. As humans, we know that we are both physical and spiritual. So when we study this out, we understand that the Apostle Peter now is talking to a group of people who are going through suffering. And as we mentioned in the introduction to this, and then we mentioned each message, I think, when you go through suffering, certain things happen to you psychologically. Certain things happen to you in your mind and your heart. When you go through suffering, sometimes you turn inward, do we not? Has anyone ever offended you? Well, you're either going to just pull away from them or you're going to give it back to them, right? Or am I the only unspiritual one here? Come on now, bear, just be real for a second. Right, when someone attacks you verbally, it's so our flesh wants to just attack back. We want to fight for our rights, and we want to fight for what we think is our cause. And so uh, what we find here is that Peter's talking to people who had to leave their homes. Nero was the emperor. Claudius was uh, uh, one of the leaders, and they were allowing free persecution of Christians, and they were actually edicting to go out and persecute Christians. And we know that Nero was a, an insane ruler, and he was burning Christians at the stake. This is the time this is written. So when Peter is writing to this group of people, you can only imagine what's going on in their hearts as they've left their livelihoods, they've left their businesses, they've left their homes, they've left family to escape to other regions. And as this letter finds them, he is now talking about the benefits and the blessings of their salvation to stay true to God. But notice in chapter 2, verse 1, it almost kind of like, well, why would he say these things? Now notice, if you remember what I just said about their sufferings, notice what he says here in verse two, chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and all hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speaking. Okay, wait a minute. If you're talking to a group of people that are suffering, you're going to tell them to put off malicious behavior and evil speaking? I mean, kind of sounds like, shouldn't you just be telling them, yeah, exact revenge, yeah, go out there, and if you can find a Roman soldier alone, go ahead, take advantage of it, kill him. But no, he says the exact opposite. He's saying that's not who you are as a new person in Christ. That's not who you are as a believer. And so he's going to make a, a transition here in the sense of helping them to understand as they continue, continue to understand who they are in Christ. They are to, in this last passage we studied, talk about loving the brotherhood, loving the fellow believers in Christ. He's now telling them to set aside, lay aside these things and focus on something else. And so this first point here, the spiritual desire of the new believer is laying aside the ways of sinful self and then latching on to 
uh, the Word of God. So laying aside sinful self and latching on to the Word of God. So we notice again here, I'm going to define these words for you. You can just kind of understand what's taking place. When he says to lay aside the ways of sinful self, that's the old nature. Prior to salvation, you had no choice in sinning. It's just what we did. After salvation, you now have a choice. Because the Spirit of God is coming to you, He gives you the ability to choose not to participate in sinful activities. He gives you also that desire not to do so at times. If you walk close with God, you won't desire the lusts of the flesh. But if you don't walk close with God, then you're going to desire fleshly things and most likely participate in fleshly things. And so he's, again, building on this idea of uh, being, having a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, through salvation. But here's something you need to understand. You cannot grow until you let certain things go. You just can't. You cannot grow spiritually as a, as a Christian until you let certain things go from your life. And he lists five key things here that you have to let go if you're going to grow in the Word of God. If you're going to latch on to the Word of God, this will help you to set these things off, but it's also going to help you grow. And he's preparing them for the responsibility that they're going to have to understand as part of their salvation. Listen, with every benefit that you get in life, there's responsibilities. Would you agree with that? With every benefit you get in life, there's responsibilities. If you have a job, that doesn't mean they just pay you because you got the title. That they expect for you to do the work so they can pay you, correct? Right? If you, have, if you become a parent, that doesn't mean, okay, I just birthed this kid in the world, my job's done, I'm a parent. No, that means you have a responsibility now to raise that kid, provide for that kid, take care of that kid. If you become a Christian, you have now been born into a new family, you've been given the Spirit of God, and you've also been given other responsibilities that God expects for you to do to bring Him honor, to bring Him glory. And so this first part here is laying aside the ways of sinful self. You can't grow until you let certain things go. And he lists these five things here. Number one is malice. Malice is a desire to injure. It really has the idea of pent-up anger. I want to ask you if you've ever had that kind of malicious heart that you wanted to just pay someone back, you wanted to get back at somebody, but I know I have. That was just something that was inside of me as a young man. I was like, if you got me, I was going to get you back ten times worse, so you'd never want to mess with me again. That was just in my heart. And it was wrong, but that was, that was, that's malicious behavior. Not only does it say malice here, but it also says guile. Guile is deceit, but more than just deceit. It's a cleverness trying to scheme people. Trying to, to get something out of people. That's, that's guile. Then he says hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, as we studied before, is acting a part. Doing something that is uh, just trying to put on a show, to, to act a certain way in order to get something, typically. Not only hypocrisy, but envies. Envies here is spite, jealousy, or ill will. Envies. Do you think these people who are fleeing from Nero and fleeing from Claudius and fleeing from the Roman soldiers, do you think there was any of this inside of their hearts? Oh, yeah. Come on. Just think about it. If that was happening right now here today, don't you think that there would be thoughts inside of Christians Man, I want to be a vigilante. Sign me up. Where's the next militia group? I'm going to go and I'm going to exact vengeance against this invading army. Sure. We would think this is our rights. And Peter is telling them just the opposite. He said, God's kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom is from above. We are too, as Christians, to live as Jesus lived. And so we see this here. He says, to lay aside the, the ways of sins and self. The last one there is evil speaking. Evil speaking is the idea of defaming someone. Slander, we would call it today, but backbiting is another way of saying it. That's kind of an interesting term. Biting someone on the back. I mean, if you couldn't get much lower, okay, in a fight, someone turns around, then hit them. It's like, yeah, you sissy. Come on, you got to fight with someone, fight them face to face. But that's, that's when someone walks away and you start talking bad about them. When they're not around to defend themselves and you... Evil speak against them. That word evil there is wicked, just in general, wicked type of talk against someone. Now think about this. Who was Peter speaking to? Christians. Now I won't ask you for your checklist, but how are you done on this list? Peter is saying, hey, for those who are suffering and fleeing from Nero and fleeing from Claudius and fleeing from people that would take advantage of them, don't be malicious, don't pay them back, don't speak evil of them. Don't scheme to pay him back. He's telling them, this is not who you are. 
Because every red-blooded cell inside of you would want to get payback, wouldn't you? I am the only wicked person in this room. All right. So we understand that this lay aside uh, this, the, these ways, the sinful self is what he's speaking to here. But then uh, we, we have to understand that this affects us even right here and now. So where do we see this kind of sinful behavior in believers today? How about in our homes? You ever had a brother or sister do something to you and you just scheme to get them back? I'm scanning the room. You ever a parent exact a restriction on a, on a child and a child schemes how they can get back or get even with their parent? No, that would never happen. How about between siblings or how about be, on the job? You ever had an employee do something to another employee? Hey, if you turn on the news, we see this all the time. It's horrible what people are doing today. It's not that they can't just settle it by argument and like agree and disagree. It's go home, get a gun, go back to work and kill people. Folks, this is going on today. We see it all the time. This is how bad behavior becomes when people are so mad at someone and they have this pent up anger, their malicious intent. They're scheming to pay back someone. This is common to humanity without God. And so we see that these are things that take place. We see it online. I'll call it Gracebook. Mm -hmm. Facebook. People take digs at each other. People post things and they know it's, it's against this group or that group. Or people post something against this person, this leader, that leader. Okay. You're saying a lot about who you are. Your spiritual maturity when you do those things. That's, that's speaking. And again, what you're saying might be true, but choose your battles wisely. Choose where you say it. Choose who your audience is. Think about what you're doing. Because we see that sometimes that can come off as malicious or, or, or um, hypocritical for you being a Christian, but yet you're willing to defame others and speak evil against others. And so again, all these things we must not say. Lay aside civil behavior and then latch on to the Word of God. Notice what it says there in verse number 2. As newborn babes desire what? The sincere milk of the word, in reference there would be the word of God, that you may grow thereby. So here's the idea. The apostle Peter is saying, listen, you're going to have to lay some things aside in your spiritual life if you're going to pursue the ability to grow spiritually. Spiritual growth requires a diet on the word of God. Spiritual growth is like a baby who is born. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a 10-month-old grandson that's uh, sometimes is now starting to walk the hallways. Uh, but there is no question when he is hungry. He's not going up to his mom and say, Oh, dear sweet mother, it is that time again where I need nourishment. It is, Wah! right? They just let it out. It's just there. And they desire that, that milk from their mother. And they desire that they want their food right now. There's no way. And what are you saying here as a baby and all of you women that have had a baby, you know when they desire to have that food from mom, whether it's a bottle or it's from the breast, they desire it and they crave it and they're searching for it. And he says, that's exactly the illustration for us as Christians. You should desire God's word that way. Now I can tell you myself, I'm a pastor. I don't always desire God's word that way. I love it. I know it's, it's helpful, it's great, but there's not every day that I'm craving God's word like that. But according to Peter, he says, if you want to set aside these things, you want to lay these things aside, then you must latch on to this. This is going to help cure those things. This is going to help repel those things. And every one of you that has lived your spiritual life for any amount of time, you know, as I know, the more time I spend with God's word, the more time I spend in prayer, the more time I spend with godly people, the more time I spend listening to preaching, the less those things are involved in my life. This is a spiritual concept. The Word of God is a cleansing agent. The Word of God is something that purifies the heart and the mind. It's a spiritual thing. And the more time I actively involve spending time with God, the more it sets me up not to participate in malicious activity against others. The Spirit of God slowly changes us, turns us into what we ought to be as useful tools for Christ. And so he says, as newborn babes desire that sincere milk, that word sincere, having uh, the idea of unadulterated, pure. The Word of God is pure. The Word of God is unadulterated. It is something that will feed you the right nutrients for your life. And then I want you to notice what it says here then in verse number 3. 
The if so statement there has the idea of since. Since you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That's a reference to salvation. Since you have tasted that the Lord has saved your soul. He's been gracious. He found you, he found, you found favor in the eyes of God. And he saved your soul. So since you have been a part of God's salvation because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is so important that you don't miss this. The word taste there has the idea of wetting your appetite. Wetting your appetite for something. And I've, it's, it's always uh, fantastic when a, a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ and they ask Jesus Christ to come into life and, and, and they sincerely trust Christ their Savior. You see their desire for God's Word. You see their desire. like, hey, Pastor, when's the next service? I don't want to miss anything. Hey, got any books that I should be reading right now? You know, what book in the Bible should I start reading? And hey, are there any other studies going on in the week? I just want to be around God's people. I want to keep learning. That's a newborn babe in Christ. They desire to be around godly people and, and be fed spiritually. But most of us know over time that kind of dies off. And you have to kind of rejuvenate that. And you have to spend that time with God in order for him to kind of uh, uh, re, re, give you that joy once again of your salvation. And so we find then that this latching onto the Word of God, though, is a key for setting aside those things. And then the, the experience of tasting of the graciousness of God. Once a person gets saved, their desires do change. But listen, their desires can change back again. It's not that they lose their salvation. It's that if they, if they have a diet of junk food, they'll desire and crave bad food. But if they give themselves proper nutrition... When they taste junk food, they might like it, but they know, okay, that's not good for me. I'll give you an illustration. When we talk about desires change with needs or experiences, someone who embarks on getting in shape must go through a detoxification process, do they not? When you first go to work out, that next morning you wake up, you're like, oh my goodness, why did I do that to myself, right? Your muscles are screaming in pain. Right now my hammy's hurt because my son Joel challenged me to a squatting contest. Uh, not a contest. He just said, here's a new workout, Dad. And I thought I work out three days a week at least. And so I tried his workout routine and my hamstrings were hurting. <clears throat> but anyways, detoxing yourself. When you, go, when you decide that you're going to clean up your insides in order to eat better. And those first three days are like, why? Why would anyone detoxify? This is horrible. I hate giving up my food that I love, right? And our body is, is now getting used to a uh, more nutritional diet. And what happens after time, if you stick to it, vegetables become so sweet to your taste. You're like, I never knew a carrot could taste like sugar. I never knew that certain vegetables could taste so good. Why? Because we've had such a steady diet of improper nutrition We've added all kinds of other things in there. It robs us of the right tastes. And this is like our spirituality. When you feed yourself entertainment that is not godly, but even so, it doesn't have to be ungodly. You could feed yourself good entertainment. And if that is robbing all your time and, and all of your energy, you'll stop focusing and feeding on the proper nutrition, the Word of God as a Christian. And over time, you don't even realize it, but you're just slipping away from the spirituality that you have, and the Word of God becomes kind of dull to you. It's not as entertaining anymore. It's not as desirous to you. So what you have to do, again, is go on a detox. Get rid of the entertaining stuff and say, you know what, I'm just going to spend time in the Word of God. And don't freak out when the first couple days you're like, ah, this is boring. I mean, I love God's Word, but I don't want to read it this much. I don't want to hear preaching this much. I don't want to be around Christians that much. But if you go through the process, it gets sweeter and sweeter. It's, it's just the part of what, it, as humans, it's part of the process. And so we must understand that this idea of laying aside and then latching on to the Word of God, I, I, I just dare to tell you that if you truly do latch on to God's Word and bathe yourself in God's Word, it cleanses us from the inside out. It purifies the heart, purifies the mind. But at the same time, you've got to lay aside things that are ungodly. You can't mix the two. Because if you mix the two, the ungodly stuff is going to win out. It's just the way it is. The desire to be fed is normal to any newborn creature. Babies like their mother's milk. If, there's, if, they, if, if they do not, then there's something wrong with the health of that baby. 
Christian babies like God's word. I've never met a newborn believer in Christ that has not desired the word of God. Never, never met them. A true believer. They want to know more about God's word. They want to study. They want to be in church. They have a desire for knowing God, knowing his words, and knowing his people. And when a Christian stops desiring God's word, God's house, God's fellowship with his people, that means there's something wrong with your nutrition. We need to go back to a place of being bathed in God's word. And that's the first point to this, to this idea of spiritual desire of the new believer is to truly lay aside those things that are uh, un, uh, unbeneficial, if you would, or ungodly, and then latching on to the, the milk of the word of God. Secondly, the spiritual blessings of the new believer. So here's the transition. Verse number four. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So those in verse number three who have tasted of the grace of God, tasted of salvation, you've trusted Christ your personal Savior. Then it goes on to say, to whom coming as unto a living stone. This living stone is speaking of Jesus Christ, and I'll bear this out as we go through this text. The living stone here, there's three metaphors that we'll see here in this text. It's the metaphor of the stone, Metaphor of the house and metaphor of the priesthood. These three are explained here. I could take each two of these verses each and preach whole message on these verses, but I'm giving you the overview today. I might come back at a different time, but I want you to see this. The word coming here in verse number four has the, the idea of drawing near to God continually. When you've tasted of the goodness and gracious of God through salvation, and you are constantly, in the essence, you're constantly coming to God. John 15 is a great portion of Scripture to study about this, verses 5 and on. It's the idea of abiding. This continuing with Christ. As you have trusted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you're constantly now able to come to Him and dwell with Him, abide with Him. That's where you get your sustenance. What is John 15? I think it's verse number 5. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can do what I will. But if you abide not in me, what happens? You cannot do the things that benefit God. You cannot produce spiritual fruit. So again, this is borne out in the scriptures, the importance Peter, Peter is laying on here of spending time with God. But the spiritual blessings of the new believers start with this understanding, and then we, we speak of our, our responsibility. So these metaphors, stone, house, priesthood. Let's go through this real quick. The stone, as I mentioned, represents first and foremost Jesus Christ. Notice what it says here in verse number uh, Six, wherefore also is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Here's another reference to this idea of stone, but it's a chief cornerstone. Now, if you are not aware, oftentimes Peter, uh, Jesus, the apostles would use the temple, the physical temple, to speak about their religious uh, uh, truths. So the chief cornerstone, this is an Old Testament concept, uh, but it's something that's very um, applicable. So picture this corner right here, and there's a giant, massive stone that would set the corner of the temple being built. This cornerstone sets the, the direction for the angle, this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. It has to be level, it has to be plumb, it has to be set in its proper place. That determines everything else. And so the scriptures speak of the Messiah, the Old Testament speaks of the Messiah being the chief cornerstone. So this is now a reference to Jesus Christ. And on that stone, he will then add other living stones. This gets cool. Who are the other living stones? True believers. So Jesus is our foundation, and then every time someone trusts Christ as their personal Savior, they become a living stone, and he is placing them in this new building, the spiritual idea of the temple being built. It's a spiritual concept. It's a metaphor. He's giving us an illustration of God building his house with his believers because they so appreciated the temple of the Old Testament because it was where the presence of God was. It's where, where God's presence was supposed to be. And so here he's saying, listen, Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the chief cornerstone. And so we notice that in verse number 6, it mentions this. And I want you to notice down in verse number uh, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them 
which be disobedient, the stone that the, beater, the, the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. So here's another reference. Those who rejected, the word disallowed there, rejected Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Doesn't matter, he stole the stone. Even though they rejected him, he is that stone, all right? So then we go down to verse number eight. And a stone of what? Stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. All right, I'm just setting the idea of the stone. So here we have that Jesus was a stone of stumbling. Remember, the priests in the New, in the New Testament, as we see it recorded there, the Jewish priests stumbled over Jesus Christ being the Messiah. They said it can't be. This doesn't fit in our, in our scheme of thinking. Although the scriptures spoke of it, that yes, it is Jesus Christ. But they rejected Jesus Christ. They tripped over this stone. They could not comprehend that Jesus was the actual chief cornerstone. He was the Messiah. And so Peter's drawn this out. Now, this is kind of interesting because we know that there's a teaching, and it's not a correct teaching uh, today, that Peter is the rock of the church. Now, you study that, it's Matthew chapter 16. Peter here is doing a great job saying, who is really the rock of the church? He was like setting this aside, saying, hey, I don't want there to be any confusion. I am a little stone compared to Jesus being the big chief cornerstone. Remember? This is so important you don't, get, you don't miss this because he's also talking about the priesthood. And as a former Roman Catholic, growing up as a Roman Catholic, man, we looked at the priest as untouchable. We looked at the priest as, man, you had to be someone special to be a priest and you had to go through training and all this kind of, they dedicated their lives to the church and, and all that on, on its surface is great. But we have to understand is that our Bible teaches something different about priests. And Peter is getting ready to talk about that. And this is where it should get really special to you as a believer. And so not only we see the spiritual blessing of the new believer is that Jesus equates us as little lively stones or living stones. Back in verse number uh, five, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual what? House. You and I are the living stones that make up a spiritual house, or if I could use another word, a temple. We are God's temple. He is using every believer to be another stone in his temple. Now, it's interesting when you consider this, there are certain tools that were used to hone down the rocks, to make them square, to make them rectangle, so it was easier to stack these stones on top of each other. You wouldn't put a rock with a point on top of a flat rock. It would just fall over, right? I think we all get this. So they had tools, they had chisels, and they had different types of tools and apparatus to hone these stones down. Do you know what is honing you down as a Christian to make you a better living stone for Jesus Christ? Go back to verse number two. It is the word of God. God's word is what is honing down this malicious behavior inside of us as Christians. His word of God is making us more like him to understand his pure words that is washing us, that is chiseling off the hard edges of us so we can be stacked on top of the cornerstone. That we can be added to Jesus Christ in this spiritual sense. How important it is us to bathe ourselves in the Word of God. Let God use the Word of God to hone us down, to be a tool to be used for His Word, for His work. And so we see then this idea of a house comes in. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 with me, if you would. Or hold your place there as I read it to you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. Talking about this spiritual household or, or, or being a, a, a house for God. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. What it says here is, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, unto an holy temple in the Lord. So here we have it all. He mentions that we're fellow citizens. He mentions that we're also with all the other saints, talking about other believers. He also mentions here that Jesus Christ, we are built on top of the chief cornerstone, uh, that we are building fitly framed together and groweth unto the holy temple. So all this is uh, imagery, illustration talk, if you would, for being a spiritual creature who is now being a part of Christ's building, 
A spiritual building made by Jesus Christ. So you as an individual make up a living stone. We as a church make up the household of God. And we are added then to God's temple in this respect, in a, in a spiritual sense, as we look here to, the, to these words. But I want you to notice back in verse number five of our text again. He says, Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and an holy, what? Priesthood. I have to be honest with you, when I was a young guy and I started reading the Bible and started to understand this, coming from a Roman Catholic background, when I read this and I was like, you mean to tell me that I'm actually considered a priest because I got saved? And that's exactly what this is. This is called the believer priest. You and I are believer priests. What is a priest? A priest is someone who has direct access to God. This is pretty cool when you think about it. When Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, does anybody remember what happened? One of the major events that happened in the temple, there was a large curtain that was between the inner uh, part or the, the Ark of the Covenant and the main part of the uh, Holy of Holies. Does anybody remember what happened to that, that curtain? It tore in half, indicating that Jesus Christ now has done everything necessary to pay in full direct access to God for our salvation. This is beautiful. Because now you don't have to come to a pastor. You don't have to go to a priest and ask him to uh, 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 atone for your sins. You have direct access to God yourself. This makes you a believer priest. When you trust Christ, your personal Savior, you actually become a priest in the eyes of God. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like that. Because this smacks against certain religions. But that's exactly what it says. You and I, and it says more as we study this out. It says more about this in other passages as well. But Jesus is our great high priest. We are his servant priests. We are left here. One of the spiritual blessings is our new birth, but also a spiritual blessing is that we get to serve him as priests on this earth. There's so much more to this, and I know I could teach a whole series on this alone, but I want you to just, for the sake of time, move along with me. So we see that in verse number 5, he mentions the priesthood. Skip down to verse number 9 with me, if you would. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal, what? Priesthood. That word royal has the idea of kingly. So not only you are you made a priest at your salvation, but you're also a kingly priest. You are one of God's priests at salvation. Now, think about that, where you're at right now as a, as a saved person, as someone who's trusted Christ your Savior. How does that fit into your life, that you are a kingly priest? What does that say about who you are? What does that say about your responsibility? See, a lot of times we say, well, yeah, I got saved. You know, that was way back. And, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Wait a minute. You're more than that. You're a priest of Almighty God. You're a kingly priest because he is the king. He has made you one of his sons, in essence. You are a king or queen priest, if you want to say it that way. And there's responsibilities that come along with that for us as believers. So what we see here then is this idea of the stones, we are the living stones. The house, all of us together make the house or the temple of God. The priesthood, this is now our responsibility. It's our blessing, but it's also our responsibility. It comes with responsibilities. And so we, the picture of God's building a spiritual temple with living stones. The word of God is continually at work honing down and making us a more appropriate stone for placement in the temple. The blessings of being used of God for his work. We are choice stones for his building and we are chosen priests for ministering. In this text, we see the idea of a union with God. And I like what uh, the commentator Clark says this. It is in union with him that they live and answer the end of their regeneration. Regeneration meaning being born again. As stones of a building uh, uh, are of no use, but as they occupy their proper places in a building and rest on the foundation. And so our foundation is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. And as I allow myself to be honed and hewn by the word of God to take out the 
fleshly desires of John and to be more spiritually, God places me in his building. And he can use me for his purposes and he can use you for his purposes if you're willing to allow him to do so. As we look at verse number 8, or excuse me, go back to verse number 7. I'll just read through this and finish up here in just a moment. It says, Unto you therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which is disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and the stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the what? Word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So here we have the idea, there are many people that still stumble at the word of God, the testimony of the gospel being necessary for salvation. There are some people like the Jews saying, no, it is our heritage, or no, it is because we have all the commandments. It's because of our good works. It's because of our ceremonial cleansings. That's how we know we're assured to go to heaven. And over and over again, we see Jesus and the apostles and the teaching of the Word of God saying, that's not how you become right in the eyes of God. It's Jesus Christ who is God who came to this earth for a purpose. It was to die in my place. It was to die in your place on that cross. And when he was buried, after they, they killed him and, and crucified him, then he was buried in the tomb and he rose again from dead, proved that he was God. And those who truly believe in Jesus Christ, who are not offended at his word, will embrace Jesus Christ and accept him as their own personal savior. Not just mental knowledge, but in their heart, the spirit of God has linked the two together and they believe and they trust Christ as their savior. And it changes their eternal destiny. It gives them a new spirit. That's being born again, regenerated. God gives them that. And I want you to notice in verse number 9 and 10. But ye, talking about those who have, say, have trusted Christ, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know what the cool thing you hear is? Who is this said first to? The Jews. God called them, being not a, not a great people. Why would God choose the Jews? He says, not because you're mighty people. He said, because I, in my mercy, chose you. And what, what Peter is doing now is saying, hey, quoting a reference that was used for the Jews, he's now quoting this reference and he's using it for Christians. He said, you also, in a spiritual sense, are God's chosen generation. Think about it. If God gives you, right now, we're in 2021, if God allows you to live to 2022, and 2000, or 2032, 42, 52, each 10-year increment, that time frame you're here on this earth, whatever it is, how are you using what God has given to you for his purposes? Because surely when it's all over, you look back and say, oh man, I'm not sure what I really did for God. I'm not sure what I really invested in God's work. I'm, I'm part of his chosen generation. I'm a royal priest. What have I really done for God with my life? So we see here that he says, you're a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. One of the responsibilities for us as priests is to bring praises to God, to offer sacrifices of praise. Now we do that with our songs, we praise God in that manner, and that is a true sacrifice of praise. Prayers are another way that we offer praise to God, by prayer. Also, by serving one another, by speaking the word of God and helping people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. All these, and there are many other things that can be listed as far as being a believer priest. How do we then act on that responsibly? So we not only have the blessings of our salvation, but we also have the responsibility that we as believer priests should be speaking and encouraging and serving one another. Peter has revealed to us how God views his believers. Are you willing to lay aside the unbecoming sinful behavior and pursue the sincere milk of the word of God? Are you willing to take up your privilege 
as a living stone, a spiritual house, a royal priest, and serve God? Are you willing today to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone as your personal God and Savior? Jesus is presented in this portion of Scripture as the chief cornerstone. And He is that stone which every believer then is placed upon to build His spiritual house. And He uses the Word of God to kind of hone us down, correct us, get off the rough edges. And that's a lifelong process. Salvation is immediate. Sanctification is a process. So how are we doing? Are you willing to claim your position as a royal priest of God? Then are you willing to have a steady diet of the Word of God? To bathe yourself, to purify yourself, to set aside, lay aside these ungodly things? Being one of the major aspects of the priesthood was being separate from ungodliness. Once you dabble in ungodliness, it doesn't matter how much Bible you read, ungodliness is going to win out. You cannot do both. You must set aside that and fully jump in to serve God, or else you're going to slowly just keep going back towards the ungodly things. It's just true. So which is it for you? Are you willing to lay aside things and serve God? Are you willing to take up your privileges as a priest and also the responsibilities? Perhaps someone here today or at home, it's today, today the day of your salvation. Are you ready to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to present these truths and